Hello. Um, it's been a while. <laughs> I thought I would pop in today and just have a little update and catch up with you. More of like a vlog video. I think I'm going to call this a vlog, not a podcast, just because I really don't have any crochet to share. Um, although there will be a podcast coming soon. But yes, I just thought I would update you. I've had lots of lovely messages over various platforms asking for, you know, asking when the next episode of the um, podcast will be out. And um, yeah, so I thought I would just come on and, and chat you through a little update and maybe do a bit of a book haul. Um, I've got lots of books to share and I feel like I'm going to save my current reads for the podcast to talk you through what I'm reading at the moment but I have been buying lots of books throughout the year I mean these are from sort of Christmas and um the past sort of five months really so there's too much to catch up on in a podcast so I thought I'd do a separate video um a sort of like a book haul really and I've got um some new titles I thought I would share my current library loans as well because I'm always interested in what people have taken out on their library cards and then I've got a few secondhand books that I picked up too um so yeah we'll do that and then I have got some like vlog footage some um sort of footage from days out I mean there, have, there isn't much to be honest with you but I will put that on the end as well so if you'd like to see some of the walks we've been doing um and some of the places that we've been we did get over to um, Bristol not long ago to see the um, interactive um, Van Gogh um, exhibition and that was really lovely. So yeah, so I'm, we'll call this a blog, but I thought I'd take the time just to update you on, you know, what's been going on. Um, you know, nothing really, nothing to worry about, just life. Um, I really did not expect to, when I filmed the last vlog, I think, was it a vlog? In November, I fully expected to be back, but I was really struggling with post-COVID fatigue, um, and I'd not long started a new job, um, so I was really tired. And I think Christmas just came and went, and I really just took January. I generally hibernate in January anyway. Um, I just really wanted to take January to focus on my health. Um, but then, since then, we've just—it just seems to be one thing after the other. We lost, um, you know, a very dear family member, um, and then we all got another dose of COVID. If you can believe that, we caught COVID again in um, that would have been February, in the middle of February, and I was quite ill. I mean, not you know seriously ill, but I felt very uh, ill. I don't think it helped that I also had a, I was on antibiotics for a, a tooth infection. So, um, you know, maybe that, that didn't help, but I was, I had to take two weeks off work. I was just really, I mean, the first week I felt really like I'd been sort of hit by a truck and the second week I was just exhausted. So, and then after that, Rob got it, the children got it again. So it felt like we were just permanently battling COVID. Um, and then, yeah, just lots of little things. Our cat died. Um, she was nearly 20, so, but, you know, we we're very sad. She got quite poorly. Um, so just been lots of things. And, you know, lots of people around us are having a really hard time as well. And it just it sort of felt like we've been in survival mode, you know. <laughs> so... I like to say we're coming out of it, but you know, my anxiety is at an all time high. I feel like every day I'm just really having to remind myself to, um, you know, do self care really. And um, which is hard because my middle child is just about to sit his GCSE exams. Um, you know, and after two years of sort of a lot of home learning, it's quite stressful for them. So we're really trying to just keep the pressure off. Um, you know, but at the same time, there's lots of uncertainty. So, um, yeah, and I am the type of person that when I feel particularly stressed, um, well, not stressed, worried, I think, more, um, I find it hard to be creative. Um, so, although I have been slowly picking up my crochet projects again, I did just finish one which that was over two years old, and it feels like only yesterday that I started it. So I've got two tops that I've finished, um, and another little project to, to show you. But, um, sorry, that's my watch going on. So I will do a podcast, and I also had a pattern ready to be released, 
um, but it's kind of a winter pattern, so it was a winter pattern, so I think I'm going to have to wait till autumn to share that one now. Um, and I bought some new yarns, and I had some new books, and I was also reviewing um, a beautiful like tapestry kit course. So, you know, all of that kind of just got dropped. So I will try and pick up from where I left off, but to save the kind of stress, I feel like I'm just going to start afresh with a fresh out outlook, you know. Um, so I am working through some of the patterns that I had started, but feel ready to be creative again and to start some new things. So we'll see. We'll see how we go. But anyway, we'll get on to the books because um, I know that lots of you do enjoy book talk in, um, in the podcasts. And, um, you know, if that's not your thing, absolutely feel free to skip onto the footage. I'll put a little... Um, timestamp here maybe when the book talk stops but there are quite a few to get through so if you are interested in that <laughs> make yourself a cup of tea and get comfortable I've got my coffee today so it's all good and typically the day that I chose to film <laughs> it's absolutely tipping it down so I've had to put the light on anyway we'll get started with talking you through some of these new books so I'm just going to pull them off um, most of these also are unread. <laughs> so, anyway. so the first one is Dinner with Edward. Now, if you I watch the it's the Miranda Mills podcast, she's on YouTube, I will link her account below. Lots of you actually recommended Miranda's channel to me, and um, I actually came across it. I don't know, in the summer I took my first trip to Persephone Books, if you remember, it's on one of the vlogs, I, I will link it, uh, my daughter and I went to Persephone Books and I was, you know, I'd never been before and I really didn't know what books to pick, I knew I wanted to get a couple, so I actually found Miranda's channel when I was searching, um, you know, what Persephone Books to buy. <laughs> And she had a whole video on it, on her favourite Persephone titles, which was really useful. And I did actually pick up um, a couple of them. So anyway, um, she also does a lovely, um, it's called, I think it's called the Comfort Book Club. Um, so every month, her and her mum um, pick a book and, you know, she, they're all very, well, cosy titles. Um, Miranda really um, also likes the interwar period, which I love. So there's, if you know, if you're interested in that sort of era, you would absolutely adore her podcast. Anyway, this one isn't, it's um, a new book, but it's um, called Dinner with Edward. It was their January pick for the cosy or the comfort book club. I, I started it and then put it down um, but I was really enjoying it, but I, I don't know what happened. But I'm really looking forward to finishing it. I think when I realised that I wasn't going to be able to finish it in time for the... Um, so at the end of the month, they do a discussion on the book and you can send in voice notes and that's really lovely. I, um, yeah, so I didn't make it in time, so I didn't read it, but um, it's lovely. Um, so I'll just um, read you the, um, the inner pages. It said, um, with its delicious food, warm jazz and stunning views of Manhattan, Edward's home was a much needed refuge for reporter Isabel Vincent. Her recently widowed 90-something neighbour would prepare weekly meals for her. Dinners Isabel would never cook for herself. But over long dark evenings where they both grieved for their very different lost marriages, Isabel realised she was being offered a gift greater than crisp martinis and perfect lamb chops. Um, so really, it's a book about loneliness, anxiety, unexpected friendship. I really love that. Yeah, so it's a non-fiction, but it's, you know, the, the little bit I read, I've only got to page 44, I was really enjoying it. So I fully intend to finish reading that. Um, let's see where to put these. Um, the next one I've got here is The Language of Food. So oh, can you see that? The light's shining right on it. There we go. It looks beautiful, doesn't it? Um, this one says, England, 1835, when Eliza Acton is told by her publisher to write a cookery book instead of the poetry she loves, she refuses. But after her father is forced to flee the country, Eliza must earn a living. 
Despite having never cooked, she is determined to learn. She hires young, destitute and curvy to help in the kitchen and together they discover a mutual talent and passion for cooking and for recipe writing. But as Anne finds her voice, uh, Anne finds a voice of her own, their radical friendship starts to fray. Based on the true story of Britain's first domestic goddess, the language of food is sumptuous feast of a novel about the women who changed the course of cookery writing forever. I was just so interested in that. And I did, as part of my degree, we did um, a course on um, like cookery and recipe books. Um, so fascinated. So I'm really looking forward to reading that one. When I'll get the time, I honestly don't know. Sorry. Uh, this one, Cleopatra and the Frankenstein by Coco Mellos. Just look at that cover. Isn't that beautiful? And the dog doesn't realise it's raining. He wants to go out for a walk. Um, this is a kind of modern day romance from what I can gather. Again, I'll read you the gumph. It says, New York is slipping from Cleo's grasp. Sure, she's at a different party every other night, but she barely knows anyone. Her student visa is running out and she doesn't even have the money for cigarettes. But then she meets Frank. 20 years older, Frank's life is full of all the success and excess that Cleo's lacks. He offers her the chance to be happy, the freedom to paint and the opportunity to apply for a green card. She offers him a life of imbued with beauty and art and, hopefully, a reason to cut back on his drinking. They are everything each other needs right now. Cleo and Frank run headfirst into a romance that neither of them can quite keep up with. It reshapes their lives and the lives of those around them. Ultimately, this chance meeting between two strangers outside a New Year's Eve party changes everything, for better or worse. It says, Cleopatra and Frankenstein is an astounding and painfully relatable debut novel about the spontaneous decisions that shape our entire lives and those imperfect relationships born of unexpectedly perfect evenings. Oh, so I hope, I've got high hopes for that. Um, I mean, don't normally, I'm not really a big romance reader, but uh, there's just something about the kind of realistic <laughs> romance kind of um, novel that draws me in. I am very, you know, interested in those um, imperfect relationships. Anyway, the next one is, this one was totally a um, influenced by TikTok. Um, I saw this a lot. It's, I believe it's a YA novel. That doesn't bother me at all. Um, but look at the cover. It's called The Wild, Wilder Girls, um, and it's by Rory Power. It's about a sort of a pandemic, from what I understand. Um, it sort of was giving me Lord of the Flies vibes, <laughs> Pan but pandemic edition. Um, anyway, I'll read you the blurb. It says, it's been 18 months since the Raxter School for Girls was put under quarantine. Since the tox hit and pulled Hetty's life out from under her, it started slow. First the teachers died one by one, then it began to infect the students, turning their bodies strange and foreign. Now, cut off from the rest of the world and left to tend for themselves on their island home, the girls don't dare wander outside the school's fence, where the tox has made the woods wild and dangerous. They wait for the cure they were promised as the tox seeps into everything. But when Bayat goes missing, Hetty will do anything to find her, even if it means breaking quarantine and braving the horrors that lie beyond the fence. And when she does, Hetty learns that there's more to their story, to their life at Rexter, than she could have ever thought true. So that sounds really good. Um, yeah, I definitely look forward to reading that. Um, got the Book of Magic. This is the last um, book in the Practical Magic series, which I have loved. Um, I've really enjoyed all the books. I particularly liked the last one, which I think was Maria's story. So this is about um, a new generation of Owens girls and Aunt Jet finding the secret to breaking the Owens curse. So I'm, yeah, I'm really going to take my time to read that because I've just really enjoyed the, the series. 
Um, and then I've got this one the other week actually. This is um, Electra by Jennifer Saint. It's a um, sort of retelling of the Greek story of Electra and that was one we studied a lot when we were doing the Greek tragedies in drama so um, I was drawn to that straight away and I think we went, we did go and see a performance of it and I, I don't know if it was Zoe Wanamaker, I don't know, I might be making that up but I'm pretty sure. Anyway, this um, says it's a beautiful, beautiful and lyrical retelling from Jennifer Saint. The house of Atreus is cursed, a bloodline tainted by a generational cycle of violence and vengeance. This is the story of three women, their fates inextricably tied to this curse and the fickle nature of men and gods. So it's got um, Clytemestra, Cassandra and Electra. Oh yes. I am ready. <laughs> I'm ready to go back there. And then, oh, last of the fiction books is um, Violetta by Isabel Allend. Um, I've not heard of this author before. I don't know. I don't know what else she's written, actually. Oh, um, A Long Petal of the Sea, The House of the Spirits. Eva Luna. Anyway, it says, Violetta de Delvel comes into the world on a stormy day in 1920. Sold. <laughs> the first girl in a family of five boisterous sons. From the start, her life is marked by extraordinary events. The ripples of the Great War are still being felt, even as the Spanish flu arrives on the shores of her South American homeland almost at the moment of her birth. Told in the form of a letter to someone Violetta loves, above all others, this is a story of a hundred year life, of devastating heartbreak and passionate affairs, times of both poverty and wealth, terrible loss and immense joy. Bearing witness to a century of history, it is a life shaped by the fight for women's rights and the rise and fall of tyrants. Through the eyes of a woman whose unforgettable passion, determination and sense of humour will carry her through a lifetime of upheaval, Isabel Allende once more brings us an epic that is both fiercely inspiring and deeply emotional. Ooh, looking forward to that. So those are the fiction books. Um, that I'm looking forward to getting through. I, I mean, those are the next books on my list, on my reading list as well. So um, I will keep you updated on the podcast of what I think of them. I've got a, another new one that I'm reading at the moment. It's so good. I can't wait to share that with you. Um, and then I've got some non-fiction here. So I've got Worn, A People's History of Clothing by Sophie Van Halser. It says, linen, cotton, silk, synthetics, wool. Through the stories of these five fabrics, Sophie van Helser illuminates the world we inhabit in a startling new way. Travelling from China to Cumbria to reveal the craft, labour and industry that create the clothes we wear. From the women who transformed stalks of flax into linen to clothe their families in 19th century New England, to those who earn their dowries in the cotton spinning factories of South India today. This book traces the origins of garment making through time and around the world, exploring the social, economic and environmental impact of our most personal possessions, as well as the extraordinary human stories behind them. And it is separated into um, linen, cotton, silk, synthetics. Um, and it's, I've only read the introduction, but um, it's quite interesting. She um, grew up on Martha's Vineyard and there was a place um, there that they, like a dumping site for all the people that would go on holiday to the vineyards and, um, you know, anyone who lived there that wanted to get rid of stuff, they would sort of dump, dump it in this, this sort of location. And she spent her youth sort of um, thinking of all these really lovely vintage clothes and, she sort of comments on how well made they are, you know, and how they stood the test of time. And actually, she became a bit of a clothing snob because of that. And I think, you know, it's true, isn't it? When you look at like the vintage clothes that's still around, 
um, you know, you can still get a lot of wear out of them. They've all been really well made um, and made to last. And, um, you know, it sort of harks back to that time when I suppose you had several sets of clothes and that would be it, you know, maybe some work clothes and then you would have best clothes. Um, I mean, when we were younger, we had play clothes and best clothes and, you know, our, our school clothes. So it's not really that different. Although, you know, these days I think I'm a big believer in um, not saving things for best. I just, um, I think if you love something, get the wear of it. But back then, you know, economically, it just it wouldn't have been feasible for you to have bought a new um, coat or a new outfit, you know, once a year even. So um, it's quite interesting, really. So anyway, that's another, I've just gone off on another tangent. But So I'm looking really forward to um, reading through that. Um, and then my eldest daughter bought me some lovely books for Christmas. She did so well. And I think it's because we had done a, um, before Christmas, we'd had like a day out Christmas shopping only in Bath. And of course, they've got some beautiful, beautiful bookshops in Bath. Um, they've got um, Mr. B's Emporium and Top, Top is it Top? Toppings of Bath and they've just moved to a lovely new big building. Anyway, we were looking around, so we were sort of, oh that's nice, oh that's nice. So I got some really good books for Christmas from her. Um, and one of them is this one. This is The Case of the Married Woman. It's on Caroline Norton, a 19th century heroine who wanted justice for women, and it's by Antonia Fraser. I'm just gonna stop the camera a minute. Uh, yeah, there we go. So um, yes, The Case of the Married Woman by Antonia Fraser. Um, I've read one of her books. I think she did um, a Marie Antoinette, a book on Marie Antoinette, which I really enjoyed years ago. Um, but I'll read you. She, she's actually a really, really fascinating case. But anyway, I'll read you the book. A poet, pamphleteer, and artist muse Caroline Norton dazzled 19th century society with her vivacity and intelligence. After her marriage in 1828 to George Norton, MP, she continued to attract friends and admirers to her salon in Westminster. Most prominent among her admirers was the widowed Prime Minister, Lord Melbourne. Wracked with a jealousy, Norton took the Prime Minister to court, suing him for damages on account of his alleged criminal conversation, adultery, with Caroline. A dramatic trial followed. Despite the unexpected and sensational result, acquittal, Norton legally denied Caroline access to her three young children. He also claimed her income as an author for himself. It's absolutely incredible, isn't it, when you think back? He also claimed her income since the copyrights of a married woman belonged to her husband. Yet Caroline refused to despair, faced with the personal cruelties perpetuated by her husband and a society whose rules were set against her, she chose to fight, not surrender. Over the next few years, she campaigned tirelessly. Provisions which are now taken for granted, such as the right of a mother to have access to her children, owe much to Caroline, who was determined to secure justice for women at all levels of society, from the privileged to the dispossessed. So that's going to be really fascinating. I don't know much of the story, only, you know, the, sort of the, the basics. So I'm looking forward to delving into that a bit deeper. Um, and the other one, actually, I'll show you this one that she bought me. Um, this is called The Pocket. And it's a history of <laughs> women's pockets. <laughs> But more so, um, you know, the things that they carried within them. So back when women would wear very big dresses, um, they often had would, would have a separate pocket um, that they could slip their hands in. It would be tied separately so it wouldn't be attached to their dress. And this is a book looking at, um, you know, the pockets that have been found and how much detail went into them and they and really the contents of them as well so um you know the famous um rhyme lucy lockett lost her pocket <laughs> so and it is fascinating um you know the history really of 
I mean, these women with these pockets would take everything that was valuable with them. I mean, not I'm sure not all women and not, you know, all the time, but, um, you know, there was adverts of the pockets that were lost and they had things like not only their money, but they would have things like their silver thimbles. Um, so I suppose in an age where there was very little privacy, you know, the things that were kept in a woman's pocket were quite telling. Um, and I find that fascinating. It's kind of the modern day equivalent of watching a what's in my bag video. <laughs> Which, um, it's just always so fascinating, uh, you know, what's important to people. I just find that really fascinating. So I've been working through this and, you know, they're sort of saying the fact that these pockets were so, um, you know, well embroidered and, you know, they were really sort of looked after, like, the sense of value. I mean, look at these. It's just amazing, isn't it? Anyway, I love this book, but um, I've been reading through it. Just, you know, it's been on the um, coffee table and um, I've been getting so into it that I've even been using my, well, <laughs> I picked up one of these from the car boot cell and I use it so I can get right in and look at the pictures. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I was really lucky, really, really lucky. Um, and then two books that I picked up just recently, actually. So this one is English Garden Eccentrics. Oh, look at that. It's just absolutely beautiful. It's probably not going to focus, is it? Look at that. So this is 300 years of extraordinary groves burrowings, mountains and menageries uh, by Todd Longstaff Goen. It says, in his book, Todd Longstaff Goen looks at a series of unique gardens made by English eccentrics from the 17th to the early 20th centuries. Their unusual creators from the superstitious antiquary William Stoop Stookley to the pleasure ground proprietor Jonathan Tyers and the bird-loving Lady Reed built miniature mountains, shaped topiary, collected animals, excavated caves, and assembled architectural fragments to realize their gardens in the ways that were, and sometimes still are, thought to be excessive. Bringing together garden and landscape, history with cultural history and biography, English Garden Eccentrics examines what it is about the gardener and his or her creation that can be seen as eccentric and analyzes an area of garden history that has scarcely been previously explored. Gardens seen as expressions of the singular character of their makers and therefore in effect functioning as a form of autobiography. Um, really look at the pictures in this book. It has some stunning illustrations and it is not short of them. There are pictures on nearly every page. Um, it is just full of beautiful, beautiful illustrations, um, which is one of the reasons I actually was drawn to it. Um, so I haven't started looking at it yet, but Lady Reed. Um, I think it's one of those books that I will dip in and out of as well. Um, but I love that idea of them, you know, these eccentric characters using their gardens as a form of creativity. So I think that's a really lovely idea. So I'm looking forward to, you know, dipping in and out of that one. Beautiful. It's more of a coffee table kind of book, isn't it? Um, and then um, a book that I also picked up recently is Faded Glamour by the Sea. This is a coffee table book. And this one's by Pearl Lowe. I also own her other book, um, Faded Glamour. I think, which is, I think it's just called Faded Glamour, isn't it? The photographs are always beautiful. Um, I will definitely need to get my magnifying glass out of this one. I love that. It's just like looking at a Pinterest board of your favourite things, you know. So, but this book is obviously set in sort of properties and homes by the sea. She, um, I think Pearl had bought a place and was decorating it. And I've taken, you know, lots of shots of beautiful homes. I mean, I just, I just love all the details. Um, 
And these books are always nice and picture heavy as well. So they are just a joy to browse through when you need a bit of inspiration. Um, you know, I'm always a bit conflicted with these sorts of books because you can find this, these types of images, lots of them online, but there's something to be said about just having the book and being able to look at it at your leisure. So I really love that and I really love her style. So um, yeah, I'm really happy to have that one. So that's it for new books. Um, I'll quickly show you what I've got out of the library at the moment. So I have this National Trust book called Walled Gardens. Um, another really coffee table book. I do own a lot of the um, National Trust books, but I don't have this one. And I quite often, if we've got them in the library, I do like to um, take them out first before I make the decision to buy them. Because obviously these books are big, they're heavy, and they take up a lot of room. And um, they're expensive, quite frankly. Um, so I like to take them out, have a read through. <coughs> Are you okay? <laughs> Have a read through and, um, you know, if I feel like it's one I can't do without, I will buy it. <laughs> um, sometimes secondhand from eBay or I look out for them in charity shops, but I really do like to, um, that's, this, especially with these bigger books, I've been doing that more and more. Anyway, this one's on walled gardens. I love a walled garden. I think they're beautiful. Um, and this is a lovely book, um, you know, explaining lots of the features of the walled gardens. I think it's one I will probably look out for. I, it's not one I would buy new, I think, but if I see it at a new charity shop, I'll probably pick up a copy because, you know, the pictures are lovely. Um, and then it goes through certain, um, you know, houses that have these lovely walled gardens, I suppose. National Trust properties since it's a National Trust book um, and the evolution of the walled garden. Beautiful. So yeah, I'm looking forward to reading through that. Um, well, I have been reading through it actually and um, yeah, lovely. And then the other one um, I've got out is, um, this one is a new book by the RHS. It's Step by Step Veg Patch. Um, I liked the idea of this one because they, oh, it's not that new actually, is it? 2020. Um, so we, Rob for Mother's Day built me a raised bed in the garden. We used to have them years ago, but, um, I think when the boys were around playing football a lot, we decided it probably wasn't the best thing. But anyway, I do have my own raised bed again and I'm looking just to plant some simple, easy to grow bits for summer. So um, just some lettuce, some radishes, I'm not, and I'm not really sure what else. So I picked this book up from the library and I like that it has, I'm just trying to find, it has got some sort of um, little plants. So I'll show you here. So this one, like is the easy to grow plot and it's got like a little layout and it tells you you know what veg to pick um and then you know there's one for a family plot um again just not really good so uh or the gourmet plot i suppose for people that like to do a lot of cooking or um Oh, they've got glue artichokes in that one. I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind having a go at those. I didn't think they would grow very well. Um, anyway, um, and then even things like a no garden plot. So if you have no garden, but they've got ideas for potted, you know, what the ways to pot and look after a little sort of veggie garden. So they've got, um, what's that got? Some little peppers, beans. Um, a dwarf tomato, dwarf peas, and then you've got some herbs, some Swiss chard, lettuce. So I just think that's really lovely. And then it's sort of got pages on each individual. Um, so I really like this. I have been reading lots about the different things I want to grow. And I actually think that I probably will buy this because it's really 
just really accessible, like for a beginner. So, yeah, um, if you are new to uh, growing a veg and that, I might, I might recommend that one, definitely. It says a foolproof guide to every stage of growing fruit and veg. So, I definitely needed that. And then, the last book I've got out from the library is this one. And this is A Year Unfolding, A Printmaker's View by Angela Harding. Look at that. I actually reserved this one because I knew it was coming out and I um, wanted to get it. Have a look. I love Angela Harding's prints. You might recognise, if you've read books like The Salt Path, that's her work. Um, I think she might have done the illustrations on the, the new P.D. Jones books as well because I've got a couple and I'm pretty sure that's her work. But her illustrations are beautiful. Anyway, this book really just talks you through her. It's not really so much about her process. She does talk about it, about where she lives and, you know, what's, what inspires her. But it's mostly like a portfolio of her work. So, and her observations from her um, studio at the bottom of her garden. So, and some of these have been published in other places or commissions that she's sharing. Some of them have been done just for the book. But it's beautiful. So there's just pages and pages of her designs. And then, you know, a bit of text talking about the inspiration, um, you know, when, when the images were created, who for. So it's nature heavy. It's about the year unfolding. So you've got spring, summer, autumn. Lovely. I just I've loved all these, all these prints. So I think this may be one that I also pick up to keep. I just find it so beautiful, her work. Um, look at that, the robin in the snow. Yeah, that's really lovely. So that's lovely. So I've been really enjoying flicking through that one. So yes, I would be sorry to give that one back to the library, but I will. <laughs> but then I do think it's one that I will add to my list. Um, and then, how tight are we? Um, I'll show you very quickly a couple of the um, books I picked up at the charity shops. So firstly, this one, Enid Blyton, Jolly Good Food. We paid a pound for it. I really picked it up. It was a beautiful sunny day and um, everyone, well, the children bought me a lemon tree for Mother's Day. I've been desperate for one for years and it had some really came, well I didn't grow them but it came with some really big lemons on and I said well we must do something special with that. So um, and this had a really lovely recipe for lemon and lime lemonade. So um, and I also thought like I mean I love Enid Blyton, I love that whole just I guess this sort of imagery of picnics and you know I mean they never are like that are they from the picnics I've had with my bunch but I, I yeah there's just something very um I don't know nostalgic romantic about a picnic I just love that idea anyway it's by Anne um, Allegra McKeevedy I think I've said that wrong I recognise her from somewhere. These are lovely recipes. So, and it goes through. So it's, we've got breakfast with the naughtiest girl. Elevens is in the secret seven shed. Picnicking with the famous five. <laughs> Tea time treats up the faraway tree. My favourite in your writing books. Suppers on the secret island. And midnight feasts at Mallory Towers. What I like most about it is the recipes are really, really easy there are lots of things like quiches um you know sponges cakes salads so um lulu actually made this salad so we had like a barbecue um at the weekend just just a low-key just us and she said oh can i make the salad so i said yeah absolutely and she you know, when it came out, she boiled up eggs and it was just really nice, grated down some carrot into it. I was like, wow, I really put my salads to shame. So we've made that. So 
she used the recipe there and we made the, um, the lemonade, which was delicious. So I paid a pound for that. It looks brand new. I mean, I can see why people might not pick that up. It's a bit, you know, one, almost like a gimmicky, but it's got some really, if you want a book like with just these lovely basic recipes that, you know, your children and that can get involved in, or, or even it's sort of the type of cooking that I like to do just regularly, you know, whip up a quiche, kids love it, it's easy. And another cookbook that I got is the Bloomsbury Cookbook. This is Recipes for Life, Love and Art. Look at that. Anyway, this one really I was drawn to because of the art. It's illustrated not so much with food, but with all these lovely Bloomsbury um, illustrations. And the recipes in it are, then we've got, got from Leonard, Wolf, Monk's House. Many thanks for the delicious cake which we both enjoy every day at tea. Could you be so good sometimes as to write out the recipe as I can't get any cakes made except yours that I like to eat. We go to London tomorrow, Virginia Wolf. That was a thank you card to Grace Higgins that she wrote in 1936. So, um, yeah, and there are recipes inspired by that. So tea party, fooling, seed cake. It is one of those books where, you know, you can, it, really it's to read. It's a bit, oh, it's just beautiful. Uh, Vanessa's Loving Cup, Freedom Pie, A Room of one own, One's Own's Two Menus, um, Menu One Dinner at a Women's College. Oh, just, just beautiful. I'm just really, really pleased to have it. Actually, it's in really good condition. I don't know how old the book is. Um, oh, I love it. It's got 165 illustrations, 113 of which are in colour. So I do recommend that. I don't, I'm sure you can still get that. I don't know when it came out, but that one was second hand, but um, it's beautiful, really, really beautiful. Um, and then, oh, lastly, just a couple of paperbacks I picked up. I'm just going to show you these because I can't believe how cheap they were. I've got this one. It's Shirley Jackson's The Lottery and Other Stories. It's one of the modern classics by Penguin. It was 50p. It's never been read. I picked that up at the car boot sale. And I liked um, The Haunting of Hill House, but I've not read any of her other work. So this is short stories. Um, so I thought that would be a good good way to get, you know, read some more. So I love that. And then I also got this D.H. Lawrence C and Sardinia. Again, I think this was 50p or a pound. Um, so in 1921, D.H. Lawrence and his wife Frida visited Sardinia. Although the trip only lasted nine days, Lawrence wrote an intriguing account of Sardinian life that not only evokes the place and people and local customs, but is also deeply revealing about the writer himself. Um, D. H. Lawrence wrote Lady Chatterley's Lover. I loved that. And Sons and Lovers, which I've never read. I did start reading a bit more of his work. I've uh, got a short collection of short stories. I read The Virgin and the Gypsy, I think it was, last year, which I, I enjoyed. So. Anyway, really I was sold because it's Sardinia and that is where my husband and I took our honeymoon. <laughs> so I wanted to read more about Sardinia really. So, so cheap. And again, it, it's in such good condition. It just doesn't even look red. So there is my epic book haul. <laughs> so well done if you've got through that. Um, but like I said, I will be back um, with a podcast very soon uh, in the next couple of weeks. I, I hope to have everything up together um, to film. But like, but also, um, you know, we are in the middle of exam season. So I'm really just trying to focus on my family and, and what they need. But we will see. So I hope you're all well. Um, thank you for all the lovely messages that you have sent. Um, I know I've replied with mostly I'll be back soon, <laughs> which is just my intent, which has been my intention, you know, all year. So thank you if you're, um, you know, for, for reaching out anyway and checking I'm okay. I'm fine. Absolutely fine. And I hope you are all too. I know that it's been a really, really tough year for so many people. Um, 
yeah, we've just got to keep going, haven't we? So I will see you soon. I will attach to the end of this a few um, walks that we've had. I think this video is going to be quite long. I've stopped the camera several times now, so I will edit it and get it up. Um, but I'll put some um, some little walks in that for you to, um, to have a look at. Anyway, take care and I'll see you soon.